I'd like to call to order the Board of Education meeting for Monday, January 13th. If everyone would rise to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right. Please let the record show that we have all uh, members present with Pamela Preston joining by phone. And just so everyone in the audience is aware, I have been reminded that there is some kind of a football <coughs> game tonight that we're going to try and breeze through this so everybody can get there as soon as possible. So I'll do my part. Excellent. All right, so we have uh, the, first up the adoption of agenda, including the supplemental personnel report. Make a motion we approve the agenda, including the supplemental personnel report. Okay. I'll second. We've got a motion by Jeff and a second by Jamie. All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. And uh, we had Ryan looked the bills over. Yeah, Everything I think okay? Yeah. Huh? Okay. So I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. A second. We have a motion by Ryan and a second by Tammy. All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. Um, and we have uh, some special presentations. The first one we have is to give recognition to the board. This is uh, Board of Education Appreciation Month. And so uh, we want to make sure that we give you the due credit that you uh, certainly deserve for all that you do and for the tireless work that it does uh, involve. Um, we'll put a nice thank you up. Uh, public information did a super job with the display and the uh, <laughs> place settings out front and all that. You'll also notice some nice uh, gifts that were provided for you, chips and dip that may or may not be used tonight for the ball game. I mean, that's <laughs> a possibility. Just kind of a encouragement there and then a nice certificate as well so thank you thank you um, thank, thank you, you very much it does last all month we'll try to recognize you more than just tonight but uh, you are appreciated and we want you to know that so, so what do we get in february <laughs> uh, more chips and dip. all right <laughs> well I, I just wonder if there's any correlation between board appreciation month and renewing of his contract that puts me in a good pop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for thinking of us. It's very nice. Absolutely. Okay, next up we have the Tournament of Champions presentation. So I believe we have some ladies ready for that. Good afternoon. We are the senior chairwoman for the 2020 Tournament of Champions. Over the next several minutes, we will be informing you on the upcoming tournament, which is to be held on January 23rd, 24th and 25th at the United Wireless Arena. This year marks the 77th annual tournament. It is the longest running tournament west of the Mississippi. We would now like to show you the championship night intro video from last year's tournament created by the Dodge State High School student video production team. <laughs> Again, this year's tournament will be held on January 23rd, 24th, and 25th at the United Wireless Arena. TOC is a class taken sophomore through senior year. Some of the committee's responsibilities include 
the Tournament of Champions, helping work the scoreboard for home volleyball games, helping with whack track, and helping with office work for athletic events. This year's committee includes juniors, Arissa Darville, daughter of Tila Darville, Silali Real, daughter of Herberto and Araceli Real, sophomores, Felicity Campfield, daughter of Andrew and Bethany Campfield, and Cameron Linz, daughter of Terry and Shannon Linz. My name is Abigail Harding, and I'm a senior at Dodge City High School. I'm the daughter of Derek and Jan Harding. Some of my high school activities include the Tournament of Champions Committee, varsity cheer captain, drill team captain, track, public relations officer for student council, vice president of Young Conservatives, National Honor Society, suicide prevention group talk, and fellowship of Christian athletes. My future plans are to attend the University of Kansas to receive my pre-meds, then later receive my degree in dentistry. The schedule of events for this year's tournament are on Thursday. The first round of games will begin at 2 p.m. The all-academic tournament team and current TOC committee recognition will take place before the final game. Dodge City will play the 7 o'clock game on Thursday night. On Friday morning, tournament teams will read, to, will read to elementary students in the morning. The cheer attraction will take place before the final game at approximately 7 p.m. Dodge City will play in either the 6 p.m. game or 7.30 p.m. game on Friday night. Saturday morning is the FCA breakfast at 8.30 a.m. with special guest speaker Kenny Mossman. This year marks the 65th annual free throw contest, which will be held between the second and third games. The Dodge City High School Band will perform before the championship game, and the all-tournament awards will be presented after the championship game on Saturday night. Teams coming to this year's tournament are Dodge City. It is their 77th appearance and they have 14 titles. They are featuring John Johnson and Josh Harshberger. Bishop Meage. It is their second appearance and they are currently ranked number three in 4A. They are featuring D1 recruit Mark Mitchell. Mays. It is their third appearance and they have one title. Manhattan. It is their seventh appearance, they have one title, and they are featuring Reshawn Riddick and Mitch Munson. Campus. It is their first appearance. They are currently ranked number one in 6A, and they are featuring brothers Sterling and Steele Chapman. Wichita East. It is their 40th appearance. They have 13 titles, and they are featuring Dalen Jones. Shawnee Heights. It is their first appearance. Wichita Heights. It is their 24th appearance, and they have seven titles. This is, or excuse me, <coughs> the bracket will not be re released until Wednesday, January 15th. Dodge City will play the 7 o'clock game on Thursday night. Some of the all-time greats who have played here are Xavier Kelly from Wichita East, who is currently playing football for the defending national champions, the Clemson Tigers. Bubba Starling from Gardner Edgerton, who is currently playing for the Kansas City Royals. Long Kruger from Silver Lake, who is currently the head coach at the University of Oklahoma. Caleb Grill from Mays. TOC's 2018 Most Inspirational Player, who is currently playing at Iowa State. Jeremiah Robinson Earl, from Bishop Meage, who is currently playing for Villanova. And Yorane, from Shawnee Mission South, who is currently playing at Oklahoma State University. My name is Elise Helfrich, and I'm a senior at Dodge City High School. I'm the daughter of William and Mary Beth Helfrich. My school activities include the Tournament of Champions Committee, Varsity Volleyball, Varsity Softball, President of the National Honor Society, Vice President of Student Council, Suicide Prevention Group Talk, and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. My future plans are to attend Newman University and major in biology. As senior TOC girls, our responsibilities include contacting basketball coaches, cheer coaches, officials, and Man Fridays. We also schedule halftime entertainment, which will be the DCHS drill team, the DCHS cheer team, Comanche Middle School drill team, Dodge City Middle School drill team, and other community dance and gymnastics teams. The national anthem singers for this year will be Kale Lowry, Alexa Martinez, Andrea Varela, Amy Romero, and the Madrigals. On championship night, all 220 members of the Pride of Southwest Kansas 
will, will perform the national anthem and a short show before the final game. The pep band will play for all 12 games of the tournament. The annual chair attraction will take place before the final game on Friday evening. This attraction combines all the cheer tournament's cheer squads who will perform to a mix of popular songs. The DCHS drill team will perform during halftime of the final games every evening. This includes a special surprise routine which will be performed during halftime of the championship game on Saturday night. This year marks the 40th annual Tournament of Champions FCA Breakfast. The first FCA breakfast was held in 1970, and since 1981, there has been an FCA event held annually. The featured speaker at this year's FCA breakfast is Senior Associate Athletic Director at the University of Oklahoma, Kenny Mossman. Mr. Mossman is in his 19th year at OU, where he and his staff have promoted winners of 10 College Football National Player Awards and 21 All-American citations, including four Heisman Trophy finalists and two winners of the coveted award. Mr. Mossman has been the athletic director for football during a period that has witnessed three Big 12 championships, three bowl victories, including two Sugar Bowls, and an appearance at the college football playoff. In softball, he has worked with a program that has captured three national victories. He chairs the state board for the Oklahoma FCA and is a published author who wrote the Oklahoma Football Vault in 2008. Mr. Mossman is an accomplished public speaker who brings a personal touch to this year's FCA breakfast as he played high school basketball at Winfield High School in Kansas. Tickets for this event can be purchased at the door for $10. The 2021 teams will be Dodge City, Newton, Derby, Junction City, Bishop Carroll, Shawnee Mission South, Hutchinson, and Wichita North. The Western Plains Medical Complex has been the official partner for the Tournament of Champions since 2012. Because of their generous sponsorship, the tournament continues to bring in the best teams and talent from all over Kansas. Our other sponsors include the Dodge City Community College, Forget Me Not Farms, United Wireless, the Kiwanis Club, the Lions Club, and the Rotary Club. Once again, the 77th Annual Tournament of Chance Champions will be held January 23rd, 24th, and 25th. On Thursday, games begin at 2 p.m. On Friday, games begin at 1 p.m. And on Saturday, games begin at 12 p.m. Tickets can be purchased at the United Wireless Arena box office or online at Ticketmaster.com. These are your ticket options available. The reserve sections will be 102 and 103 on the east side of the arena. All 12 games will be streamed live at dchssports.com and audio will be provided by Z98. Thank you for having us here. Are there any questions? Nice job, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. We enjoyed it. <laughs> More of the board appreciation. We do have tickets for board members here. I'll hand out later too. So. Oh, cool. awesome. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. You did a very nice job. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your work during the year. All right, we have one more special presentation. Um, Ann Jacobs has been nominated for the Life Changer of the Year. Um, Jacobs was nominated by her assistant principal, Gilbert Still, for always putting her students' interests first and acting as a positive influence in their lives. When a student or colleague walks into Jacobs' office, they know they are respected, loved, and important to her. When students come to her with concerns or issues, she is patient and kind, and she provides any resources they might need. Even if she doesn't see them every day, Jacobs has a natural ability to connect with students. She also does an excellent job at providing professional development to teachers so they can assist students to the best of their abilities. Everyone on the staff appreciates what she does for her building and students, as well as her bubbly, fun personality. I believe Anne is a life changer for many students and adults, said Steele. We are so proud and lucky we get to work alongside her at Dodge City Middle School. Very nice. Please come if forward for yes. a little yes. Very good. Thank you. 
Congratulations, Ian. Yeah, congratulations. Photo bombing it. Thank you. All right, we are now ready for Stuco reports. First up, we have Alexa Martinez Alba from Dodge City High School. It doesn't oh. look like that. <laughs> Again. Hey, no, wait, twin sister. wait a minute. <laughs> name Helfrich. <laughs> As I said, my name is Elise Helfrich, and I am the Vice President of the Dodge City High School Student Council. And I will be filling in on the behalf of Alexa Martinez, our president. The high school wrestling team beat Garden City 38 to 33 last Thursday and tied for first with Great Bend at the Invitational on Saturday. <clears throat> Both the girls' and boys' basketball teams were victorious against Cimarron on Friday, with the girls winning 56 to 22 and the boys winning 55 to 51. On Tuesday, the boys' swim team will take on Hutchinson. The upcoming musical, The Addams Family, will show February 13th through 15th at 7 p.m. in the Dodge City High School Auditorium. Tickets will go on sale on February 3rd and can be purchased at the DCHS Athletic Office. The Winter Homecoming will take place on February 7th at the home basketball games that evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're ready for Comanche Middle School. Area Sarmenta. Hi, good evening. My name is Aria Sarmenta. Um, tonight I'm giving an update on what's been going on at Comanche. Um, starting off with our Salvation Army coin drive that I talked about last week, or sorry, last meeting, we had a total of over $500 total. Eighth grade raised $53.96. 6th grade raised $94.27, and 7th grade raised $440. Wow. wow. <laughs> we need to hire them. 7th grade. Yeah. <laughs> um, from our weekly challenges, we have gone down by 121 office referrals, and we are still keeping those challenges up to date till this day. Our rewards are st we're still working on new rewards. We're talking and involving with students to get new rewards so that they're more... Um, so that they're just more interested in not getting referrals and yeah. Uh, we also started, or we did FastBridge, that went good for students. We also started our new book, Knockout, which we were able to get a book for each student provided as well as staff. We started Boys Basketball, our first game is Tuesday. Drill Team also started as well as Cheer and we also started Scholars Bowl. On January 30th, we have a speaker, Brian Hopper, that's going to come and talk to our school, as well as the high school and middle school. And we are also, our student council is also planning for our next dance, which money and supplies will be going to the animal shelter. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, finally, we have Maybelline Morales from Dodge City Middle School. Um, hello and good evening. My name is Maybelline Morales. I am the Stuco president at DCMS, and um, January for us was filled with many awards. DCMS gives out the Carnal Awards to students that achieved high academics and had no discipline for the entire first semester. This month, we are handing out 145 Carnal Awards for the first semester. Also, academic awards are given to each quarter to students with a 3.0 GPAs and higher. We have 439 students who have achieved the 3.0 GPA during the second quarter. For sports, we have boys basketball starting and track preconditioning. Um, cheerleaders are preparing for their cheer competition. On the 28th, we were having a Dare to Dream assembly. Speakers are coming to talk about how important it is to have dreams and work to achieve those dreams. NJHS is, has been working with Joe Coles for the past few years on leadership skills. At this meeting, each school will present about problem, problems in the school. Our students are presenting about issues with social media. The students that score the highest during the, the school history bee are now invited to compete in the national round of the history bee. Students at DCMS are also starting to prepare for the spelling bee. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice night. You too. <clears throat> All right, we're ready now for a recognition of visitors. Persons may present ideas or concerns regarding USD 443 schools. No action will be taken by the board at this meeting. Personalities and behavior of employees are not to be presented during this period, but are to be reported to the employee's immediate supervisor. The president shall determine the amount of time to be spent for citizen participation. If you'd like to address the board, please do so now. All right, we are ready then for the consent agenda. And that includes the approval of personnel, including the supplemental personnel report, approval of minutes from our December 9th, 2019 Board of Education meeting, approval of donation to the Sunnyside Elementary Dolores K. Cohen Memorial, uh, approval of National Park Open Outdoors Program Fort Larned Grant Award for Ross. <laughs> Approval of musical enrichment through ukuleles grant award for Beeson. Approval of Head Start, early Head Start grant application, Bright Beginnings. Approval of JAMF <coughs> IOS product Please. maintenance and support renewal. Approval of proof point email filter. Uh, and then information only, Head Start program instruction, ACF. PIHS 1902 for Bright Beginnings, <coughs> Head Start Information Memorandum, ACF IMHS 1905 Bright Beginnings, and then approval of Bright Beginnings Policy Council minutes for November 2019. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. A second. Motion by Tracy and a second by Tammy. All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. We're ready now for new business. First step is curriculum and instruction. Good evening, board members, Mr. Superintendent. On page 45, we're coming to you today to ask to get ready to move to the new administration building, so that might help here. We have a lot of equipment that we just don't know what to do with. We, we got the life out of this equipment, and now it's taking the life out of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way I know. I want you to notice on, um, on where I bulleted some of these items, and I want to share what we've tried. Um, on the wireless access points, we, you know, we got an E-rate, and we, we could replace them all, and we pulled out the older ones that were six, seven, eight years old. So we have, we have vendors calling us all the time, so we tried to sell them. And we gave the model number, we gave the serial numbers and everything, and thought we could get maybe $100 back or something. Oh, they're too old, they're, they're no good for us anymore. And I just want to mention that because we've tried. The computers that we have, they're not worth in our mind to prepare to give to parents like we have in the past. So I want you also to, I want to emphasize that we're very conscious of what we're trying to do. If the equipment is no good for anybody, we need to just have permission to, to get rid of it. It's so um, tight sometimes that companies will maybe pick it up, but we have to pay the gas mileage. So I'm requesting that we be allowed some leeway here to do that as well. Um, are there any questions? I don't think so. No. I make a motion for approval. I'm asking for approval. Yeah. Yeah. Second. <laughs> All right, we have a motion by Tammy and a second by Ryan. <clears throat> All in favor? Thank Aye. you very much. 7 0. Thanks, Ray. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam President, Board of Education, Dr. Dirksen. Um, I'm excited to be here. It's been um, a very purposeful and fruitful journey to get to this point and, and just, just marks a milestone of what's yet to come. So what you have in your packet beginning on page 47 is for informational um, review and, and receipt only. Uh, I will be bringing to the board at your January 27th meeting a formal recommendation for action. 
And so just to recap, um, this morning I had the ELA work group committee meet from 8 until about 11 o'clock. And the purpose of that was to kind of wrap up the feedback that we received prior to break and then during the, the time of break when the Learning Center was open. In fact, even as of last Friday, we had staff members across the district providing their feedback on all four, uh, well, all the materials that were um, up for review and being um, selected for review. We had 20 members from our staff at large come and take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, pretty extensive information that I personally looked at as well as the committee received those copies. So we wanted to make sure that that was um, weighed in before any recommendation was provided. I did ask every single member of the work committee to provide their individual rankings um, to make sure that we're doing our due, due diligence in particular at the elementary K-5 there were four different sets of vendors, and there's a list of them on page 48. Um, the top two for elementary came out to be the McGraw-Hill products and the Pearson. And so what I wanted to do there is do an additional force choice by removing the bottom two and just having those members again rank those top two. So we started to see, and I just wanted to make sure that all of our dots were, were connecting. Um, what I am recommending or will be recommending to the board will be Pearson products K-12. Um, part of this process, and we were very open um, with the committee as well as the district at large, was that we're looking at the best products. Whether that meant we were mixing different vendors, it did happen to come out that um, Pearson was the top uh, vendor. And so we looked at, just, just so you know, we looked at research sites that are out there, Ed Reports in particular, which will look at all these products and rate them on different criteria using a similar rubric for all materials. Um, we gathered input from other districts in the state. We used Tazen, who is working with us for MTSS, just to provide connections and feedback. Also, our independent research um, uh, and looking at these materials. So I feel very confident that it was a thorough process. As I said to the committee, and I know I've mentioned to the board as well in the past, is this is one piece of the, the overall um, focus on literacy, so reading and writing in the district. Having materials that will be K-12 um, implemented is going to be very important. Um, it, I also want to stress that how we continue to provide professional development and the way in which we utilize the materials consistently district-wide are going to be very critical to seeing our student outcomes increase. Um, in this process, we do have a textbook line item that the district has been responsible um, in, in our actions to build up those funds. We have roughly, it's fund 16, there's about $2 million of reserves in there. That's a revolving account um, that the superintendent and our CFO, through your approval, have put money in. Um, I have been working with, so, so Friday, last Friday was the last day for staff input. Um, through that selection, late Friday afternoon is when I called the representative with Pearson and said, it appears at this point that you will be our top recommendation. So we started putting together purchase orders. So I was in email exchange all weekend, um, met with the committee this, this morning. I'm not at a point where I'm comfortable giving you an exact dollar amount. A lot of it has to do with making sure that the materials that are included uh, match with what we need. I've had Dr. Vinton and several of his his um, members within his department in charge part of this committee uh, so that we're looking at EL um, supports, special ed supports, uh, as well as what is our tier one, which is the basal for everybody and additional support. So we're still digging in. Um, I also, I do want to, so there's not sticker shock when we come into the meeting in, in, on the 27th. My guess is we'll probably be within that $2 million range, we'll probably be anywhere from 35 to 45% of those reserves. It is a large purchase, it's an important purchase. That also includes not only the materials, but also online support, uh, both for students and teachers. We did look purposely at a blended approach where we have print materials and online support. Uh, PD will also be a component. Um, we are digging into the ELL um, supports in there as well. And in talking with that group and that subgroup this morning, they feel very comfortable with the Pearson product, the primary textbook for each grade level in the EL supports. But we're also looking at a secondary component that could help with uh, either a newcomer program or some of our um, uh, stronger needs for like a tier three or, or, or more supports for our English language learners. So our, we are going to be working um, pr pretty diligently over the next few days to put together this, this order. 
Um, it also, there's an opportunity, obviously, over these next, you know, but between now and our next meeting, where anybody, obviously, in the community can come address the board. I know that Carrie will probably, um, I'm going to have her share in a second uh, how we're reaching out to our business community as well. Well, why don't we do that now so I don't forget? <laughs> I'll get on a roll. We will be letting uh, the community know that they can come in and take a look at the materials so that they feel like they can see what we will be teaching. And uh, I did talk about that a little bit at Rotary, and that was very well received, just to know that they can come in and take a look at that. So we'll be doing that and getting that information out uh, through the mediums and through Chamber of Commerce and all of the ways that we can reach out to our stakeholders. I have a question. Will, will all teachers be required to use this material alone? I, you're reading my mind. I was getting ready to go there. Um, so what we will be doing is, is that when we approve these materials, so be all, uh, not only our Tier 1 but our 2 and 3 supports, that yes, those will be the materials that all district um, employees, whether it be 613 or 443 staff, will be expected to use. The, the commitment to our teachers is, is we will make sure that we are um, providing training. It will be ongoing training. And so what we'll do between now and August is be able to get, um, once we have those materials on site, they're ordered, we will take all the existing materials that no longer are supported or are district approved, and we will be reaching out to that nonprofit to come pick them up. Um, so we will get rid of all those materials. The DLT, or the district leadership team, and I know I've shared that with the board, we have processes in place that if we find through the implementation of this, these materials, we need to augment, whether it's professional development or particular components of, of the product, we will use the district leadership team to vet that. So that what we, can, what we come up with with the product is that we have something that will deploy district-wide. Um, our entire emphasis has been through our strategic plan and MTSS, is that we want alignment. And so uh, to answer your question, uh, yes. And to back that up, we've talked many times about the fidelity of this transition <clears throat> is of the utmost importance, and it's going to be the responsibility of the administration. And, uh, and then we expect the faculty to follow. But, but that's an excellent question, and it's uh, uh, very important to this whole process. Mm -hmm. And my next question is pre and post testing. Will we have an idea of where our students began and at the end of one year or two year where they, how they're doing? Yeah, we'll look at a multitude set of, of data points in there. So the, the products themselves have assessment modules in there, both with formatives and summatives. And so we're just beginning to explore the, those. We also will look at FastBridge as, as our three times a year touch points. Um, we're in discussions about adding that into summer school as a measurement as well using FastBridge. And then obviously we have state assessments and then the, the random NAEP scores, which might be a few degrees separation away from being able to have a direct correlation. But we will have multi, uh, multiple touch points in there uh, to be able to monitor growth. Most importantly is that we're able to, to get it's, it's really progress monitoring. So as we have these various assessments, if it is through Pearson, that it gives our teachers real-time data to be able to drive their instruction. We really want the, instruction, or the, the assessments to be um, prescriptive more than they are descriptive. So we get this data, now what are we going to do with it as, immediate, as immediately as we can? And so we'll have a multitude of, of touch points in there. The, um, one of the other tasks that we uh, are, will start embarking on with not only the help of the ELA work committee or additional staff members at large and our instructional coaches is, is to take what we call our curriculum guides or maps. So really we'll break down by grade level um, a sequential order of what's being taught, but it's not, and it will reference the materials, but also those assessments that I just talked about, any other supplemental materials, um, what to do during the different tiered intervention time. What we want is a very um, structured process for our teachers to be, be, to be able to use um, so that, that what we're teaching, when we're teaching it, is all going to be very consistent district-wide. The teacher expertise when it comes to their ability um, to perform their, their trade and their craft obviously is going to be very unique. And that piece is very important. Um, that's where teachers have the ability to make those relationships, connect with the kids, build that background relationship and, and knowledge base so that all these other structured supports, like the materials, the assessments, and those things can help support them in the instruction. 
So I, I will close with this. I'm very proud of the team. I know I've said that before. Um, it has been a very transparent process. As, and we'll put together a communication plan. Um, and what, we'll, what I'll say very specifically to the staff will be everything that has been talked about tonight, about the timeline, the process by which we will um, provide professional development, that these will be the district approved materials and the other ones will go away. But also to underscore the fact that we want to make sure that we're responding to this implementation in a way that we do it well so that our teachers, all of our teachers feel good about the product. Our pacing next year may be a little slower than the year after. I, I firmly support that and feel like that's, I would rather make sure that we're using the materials well, the teachers have their feet under them so that we can continue to build as we go forward. Mm -hmm. Just what do you think the lifespan of this, 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 the, I mean, the lifespan of the product, lifespan of the philosophy. I mean, uh, be, I mean philosophy is a bad word, but I mean, we've seen in my eight years, we've seen two years here, two years there, three years there, you know, and how do you project out? Yeah, um, I wish I had a crystal ball. I'd be probably pretty wealthy. Well, <laughs> um, I need your best guess. A best guess. Well, at, what we're looking at is different structures in the contract. The one I'm, we're looking at right now is six years. I just picked six years because that's one of the ones they put out there. We'll get into negotiations. So as I start to see what we want and what they provide, I'll negotiate price, uh, other things. Um, a lot of, I mean, the science behind reading and um, writing a lot of it has been around for a long, long time. Now, obviously, there's pieces that we're, that we're implementing. I think the product is, is important. I think what's even more important than that is, is how we're helping to provide training for our staff to understand what those five components of reading are. You know, what's that science behind reading? That's clearly articulated. Do I think things will come out? Yes. A case in point is dyslexia, you know, with the new um, um, requirements from the state on what we do. I'm very confident that what we have in place will meet that. And so I think uh, to answer your question, it's hard for me to know what that shelf life is of the product um, because I think it's going to largely, it will stay very similar, but I think our unique populations or needs may change over time that we need to adapt to. Does that mean we might have to get a whole new product? Maybe not. It might mean we need a different supplement or training or support structures, either in classes or those types of things. So I believe that this product can last us quite a while. My number one um, commitment is that it's implemented well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's going to have the greatest impact no matter what. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, the continuity that we're putting into the program and the fidelity that we've already talked about and this is our first big step of what we've tried to accomplish as far as uh, working towards our uh, goal of literacy. And uh, I want to compliment the curriculum leader for the work that he's done and the committees that he's had with him, as he mentioned. There's been an investment of time and an investment of work that's been put into this. And, and we're excited about it. And I know uh, Dr. Springston was worried about, uh, it, it's gonna cost us a lot of money, but how do you put a price on improving literacy in a district? I mean, it's worth every penny if we can accomplish that. And so we're, we're actually excited about this. And, and uh, I've been bugging him for several months. When are we gonna start getting this? And, and um, it, he kept assuring me along the way, we're doing all of these steps for a reason and, and it's really come to fruition right now. So. Uh, I appreciate the work you've done and, uh, and wanted the board to be uh, incredibly aware of, of what we have accomplished and, and where we're going. So uh, no sticker shock now. We've told you it's going to cost a lot of money, but we're looking forward to it. So I'm not really concerned about the money, to be honest with you. What I'm concerned about is staff. Absolutely. And the implementation. I mean. That's, um, that's why that transparency they, is so important. Yeah, that's why it, every step. It, I, they, they've had a multitude of opportunities to have input and to have observation. Right. And to be a part of the process, multitude. I just, I just want them to be on board. Mm -hmm. You use the word fidelity, fidelity to, to you know, to the product. Yep. When you get, when when you get frustrated, you go back to what you know best. Yep. And that's going to be the onus is going to be on the administrators. Yep. And that's where you the know, support to, is going to be key. You too. know, to lead that charge. So that that's a great point. We talked about that today because I asked the teachers because they're representative of their grade level, their content area, and their buildings. And I said, what's going to be very important is our communication plan. And specifically for them, too, I said, you know, be, 
be very articulate about what your role was. Ultimately, it was my responsibility through my role to make this recommendation. That wasn't what I asked you to do. But once we make this decision, we have to understand that our staff will go through various phases. It is going to be new, and we have to support them. And it's going to be work. I mean, there'll be a point where people are looking at this, and, and I mean, it's going to require time to get in, work it, and then it will be, it'll be more familiar. And so you're right. It's something that is not only with the teachers, but our administrators to be able to understand what this looks like, what it should look like, our instructional coaches, um, but also our, our teachers in, that, in our PLC structures. How do we help support each other in that implementation? But this model will tweak and clean up because we're actually starting our first meeting for the math review this Thursday. So potentially in one year from right now, I, I'll be back to you guys with a K-12 math recommendation. So are you thinking that the math um, will be about the same investment as the ESL? There's a, maybe. There's a lot of factors in there that, that could change that. Um, um, and I don't want to prescribe or be predictive as to what the outcome will come. Sure. I do know that the materials that we have right now are good products that based on those independent research groups. That does not mean I'm sitting here telling you that Eureka Math or Engage New York is for sure where we're going. No, but I will say that it will be a set of materials that we will vet. So we'll find other ones, but it's definitely going to be one that's in there. And is this a different committee or is it the same group of people? Different committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, made up the same representation, EL, SPED, math teachers, by grade level content area, administrators, instructional coaches. Yes. But we will need to... Princeton for all his hard work. I know curriculum adoption and uh, with the amount of professionals you work with and everyone has a different opinion. And that's a difficult, difficult task to get everyone to agree to a uh, particular curriculum. So I, I thank you for all your hard work. You're more than welcome. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Ryan, did you have something? Yeah, I, I had a, um, a, a comment. So, yeah, my concern, and I don't know if concern is the right word, is it, not necessarily the uh, uh, the money. And maybe this is an unfair statement, but it just seems like over the eight and a half years I've been on the board, we've started a number of initiatives, and it doesn't seem like we've always followed through or completed those mm -hmm. initiatives. Sometimes it seems like we go to the new latest greatest. And so I, I just don't want us to get into another situation where this is all awesome. We invest millions of dollars and then a year and a half later, ah, we better switch directions again. So yeah, I'm not opposed. I think it's great. You guys have done a lot of great work, but that's just my biggest concern. It seems like over since I've been on board, since, on the board, since we've been together, we've started a whole lot of things we haven't seen to fruition. And I just don't want to do that again. Mm -hmm. So I think if you look back at the steps we've taken in the last three years, this is exactly where we're at. And I think that's yeah. exactly what we're going to do differently this time. And I uh, hope to hear that you appreciate what we've accomplished. So, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the staff echoes that. They don't. That's the quickest way to remove trust is if you put an initiative out there and it, be, it comes from a top-down approach. That's why the structure by which we set this whole thing up was very much participatory and collaborative. To, for buy-in and for thoroughness, but our staff does not want that either. Um, we will, the implementation component, and I just, I, I want to be fair and honest with everybody, we're anticipating, it. it, it's, like I said, it's going to require work. To do it well, it's going to require work, but the structures we put into place with the MTSS structures, PLC structures, FastBridge, I mean, we're putting those support networks behind our teachers, um, and we will continue to be with them as we go forward, because as we mentioned before, Link is a grant name, but like I've said, writing and reading has been around since we opened schools in Dodge. We just have a different set of science and research behind it, and we have the processes we're putting into place, and I'm confident that we work it and we're diligent, but we're also not trying to jam something too fast. We need to make sure our staff is, is ready to go. Uh, so um, that is the intention. The intention is, is to move our students. Good work. Thank you. Does the program come out real quick um, that you purchased or whatever for the heel? Do, do they have trainers that come out and actually physically input it into the schools? Yes. Or help? Train? Yep. Okay. And we'll be looking at calendar date options for this spring. We need to be thinking about as we go into next year, too. So that's another piece at the cabinet level that I'll, I'll put some proposals to cabinet. Okay. Very good. 
Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. And forgive my voice, that was from screaming at the TV watching the Chiefs play. <laughs> <laughs> they must have heard you. Yeah, they, I think they did. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Vinton. Uh, greetings to all, President Kalian, um, Superintendent Dirksen, board members. <clears throat> I wanted to review with you all some of the activities that we have and we will be undertaking through the migrant and ESL program as we go forward. Um, let's see if I can get this right. Well, pardon me. It worked. Oh. One of the first activities that we have is that uh, during this current year, as we move forward in, in the spring semester up until next year, we will be working on the CRDC, um, the Civil Rights Data Collection. That is a federally mandated report. We disaggregate the data by campus and put in the report as such. We begin in the fall. We started already here in the fall, and we will finish in the spring of next year. Now, that doesn't mean that it's a very lugubrious uh, report. Rather, it comes to us in portions. And as we go through, that is a timeline for it. One of the things that we consistently do is monitor all the different aspects as related to the bilingual minutes. Now, the bilingual minutes, it is a yearly report that is due on 920 of every year. However, we need to maintain the databases as needed. As students come on board, we need to ensure that they are being tested. We train personnel on forms and procedures as to how to go about having the data in the manner that we need it and the schedules, et cetera, uh, so that we're able to work with that. Currently, we have 236 teachers on a plan or endorsed, and we have 3,268 students that are ESL. So we have a chore. Um, the next thing that we will be preparing for, and we're doing this concurrently with everything that, I've, that, that is in this report, is to prepare for KELPA. Again, this is a federally mandated state assessment. It's used to measure the uh, language growth from year to year of our students, so therefore every student that is ESL will receive a KELPA unless we're told otherwise. The window uh, for the KELPA opens in February and closes in March, and um, that uh, is sometimes an awesome task. Um, We continue to work with the cohorts. Currently, we have three cohort groups. We have a total of 74 teachers in the group. From the 1819 year to the 1920, we have increased by 20 teachers. So it is growing. Mm. <clears throat> As we are gearing down in the academic year, we're ramping up for our summer program, programming. Given the fact that we have, uh, that we receive federal dollars, migrant dollars, they are very specific in terms of the use of that money. Migrant dollars have to follow migrant students. And one of the requirements is that we serve our migrant stu students during the summer. We do this by providing STEM activities and literacy packets home. In addition to that, we have university partnerships with K-State. K-State will come in and provide for us leadership training and also uh, vegetable growing. Uh, the kids get to plant uh, a, a plant, a vegetable plant, and then they take that home. One of the things that we're also doing, one of the tasks, is that we have put together a migrant recruitment plan. Given the fact that within the past three or four years, five years, um, Recruiting families into the migrant program has become very difficult. Government, uh, the feds have really made that stringent. We're struggling and trying to identify the migrant families. One of the things, one of the barriers that we're encountering is, of course, the, 
the guidelines to recruit families. The other one is being able to communicate with a family. So we're working hard and trying to build a coalition within this community that will give us the access to be able to build those relationships. And those relationships, of course, will transcend to other things that we're trying to do as a district. Um, another area that we're working with is parent involvement. Um, a very, a definition of the parent involvement is, of course, that we provide information to the families we do that through plant visits. We go to the plants and provide information to the parents there. We do home visits. We have the migrant banquet and we have the migrant night in which we share a lot of information about the schools, about the district, enrollment dates, those kinds of things. However, we need to move to parent involvement, parent engagement rather. <clears throat> Parent engagements where the parents are more critically involved in the educational experience of their students, of their kids. And we're, in order to be able to achieve that, we need to have that relationship, that trusting relationship. And we also need to be able to train our parents with the strategies and techniques that they need to have to be able to work with their children at home. Another area that we are involved with is the extended learning programming. We do have a 21st century grant in which that provides services to students at both middle schools and at the high school. A total of 125 students are served through that. It involves academics, but it also has STEM activities that are part of that. At the elementary levels, we fund that through our migrant program and we work in collaboration with the YMCA. They provide the teachers, we provide uh, the students, and we also provide transportation for them. Currently, we have 94 students that are being served at the elementary level. Computer programming, in certain respects, we support that. We support that um, by being able to include money and be able to um, bring to the district programming such as Lexia, Rosetta Stone, Read 180, System 44, and Odyssey Wear. <coughs> Another group that we're working with is the Interventionist Para. Now, sometime past, you all received information about that. I believe that the principals are very thrilled and excited about this, and they want to expand it. I know that in terms of training the, para, the interventionist, we we decided to focus on the nuts and bolts, on being able to understand databases, assessments, and we've also paired them with the liaison so that they can go and experience a home visit and have that training. Again, looking to establish that communication within the school and, uh, and the parents. Finally, one of the things that we do is to work consistently on budgets. As you can see, our ELL, our bilingual funds are going to grow. It, these are projected amounts, and I want to say projected. Um, quite significant in our bilingual, but our migrant is going to drop. And that's how come we have such an emphasis. We have a recruitment plan in place because if we continue the way that we're going, we're going to lose more money. And hopefully through a recruitment plan, we can build those numbers up and increase the funding in migrant. Um, with that, I conclude. Do you all have some questions concerning this? What exactly does the KELPA assessment show you? Pardon me? The KELPA assessment, what exactly does that show you? It is a measurement of the students uh, comparing them. Basically, it, it just demonstrates where they are in terms of language acquisition. It provides for us uh, two scores. One of them is, of course, a scale score, which is between the range of 560 to 650. Uh, this student is a level three or a level four. So, in, but in terms of the composite scores, it gives us a level of either a one, two, or a three, with a three being a student that is proficient and can be exited out of the program. A level one and a level two, uh, those are still students that are struggling with the language or learning the language or in the process of learning the language. And that is, just, that is something that we look at because we want to look at growth from one year to the next one year's growth every year. <clears throat> and it is on the basis of that score 
that we're able to identify the students that we need to be working with uh, through our extended programming and through the uh, interventionist Paris. Okay. Do oh, sorry, no, no, no. Dr. Vinny, did you you mentioned that they've seen changed some of the criteria? Yes. That, what, what 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 have they? changed if you don't in years it. past we could go ahead and recruit a family that came in with the intent of working in a beef plant as long as they told us that parents their last word we had to honor that they've taken that away now they have to have had um, they have to come in within the past three months have received a job be working at an agri agriculturally related job. It doesn't have to be only the beef plants. It could be dairy farms. It could be roguing. It could be cutting wheat, weeding. Uh, and I see that there's cotton growing throughout Kansas, working in those areas as well. But those are the things that we need to look for. And But the biggest barrier that we have is working with certain pockets of community, very difficult to communicate with them, very difficult to engage in a conversation. We knock, nobody opens, but we know they're there. Uh, okay. Those are the things. We believe that if we build a coalition in which we can work with, with, with the ministerial alliance, with uh, the beef plants, with the union, uh, with different, in, well, bringing the growers together and having a discussion and bringing the universities also to this community, to the beef plants and saying, you know, these are the things that, that will benefit the plant and the community. Maybe we can bring them out and we can go ahead and, and start recruiting them. Okay. Have you had any discussions with the Census Bureau and, and that push and that communication? Yes, we are working with the Census uh, as much as we possibly can. We are federally funded, so we need to be very careful on that respect. But those things that we can do, we are doing. And yes, we are involved. There's been some buzz in the community about um, uh, Dodge City being the site of a refugee placement center. And I would, uh, just at some point in time in a discussion, it doesn't have to be at a board meeting, I would, because I need to know how to answer people. Um, of the, the mechanics of if a child comes in and they're not proficient in English, what, what are the mechanics? How does that, how does, what, you know, where does that child go? How is that child treated and, and how is it in relation to the rest of the student population? You know, because I get asked, I've been at, in the last two weeks, I bet I've been asked this question five times. And, and I showed the, the, the text to Dr. Uh, Dirksen and, and to Tammy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I would just like to have a way to say, no, here's what we do. And so I, I, don't, I don't need to get into it tonight because you're not prepared. I mean, you know, I know, you, but, but sometime I'd like to have that discussion. Well, one of the things that I do want to mention is that when students come in, they fill out a survey, a home language survey, and we identify if there is a presence of a language other than English at home. Right. We assess that student. And based on, what, on the results that we get from that assessment, and then we begin the discussion of... Um, what grade level, et cetera. We do have programming within the school system. At the elementaries, we, we do have, and we are focused toward being in, an inclusive uh, system where we include the students, and the, the teacher is the one that is utilizing the strategies and techniques to make the content comprehensible to that student. And um, that is what the link grant is all about working with cultural proficiency, cultural uh, advocacy, and and the strategies and techniques that have been proven to work with our ESL students. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things that we use, I mean, at board meetings, we use these educational terms, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I get it, but there's an actual way in a day, in an hour, that a child is, is you know, is taught. Yes. That's the kind of thing I want to, you know, I know there's strategies and I know, I know there's programs and I know all those things, but I would really like to know, you know, does this child walk down the hall and does he, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know if that's realistic, but, but, uh, but when you get this question and, and it's, it's, I mean, our inclusiveness has never been questioned the, from not taking care of those children. What the question is, what do they do to the other student population? 
that that that's the question that that I just need some answer. I mean, well, I need a way to answer. And, and Dr. Venn, I don't mean for you to do it tonight, okay? And I know you have a lot to say about it, but um, but but I just. I just well, one of the things, this is what I will say, is that when you begin to look at some of the school districts that are across the nation, say for example San Francisco, they have anywhere from 100 to 130 languages that are spoken there. Right. You know, so when we begin to look at our system, we basically have two languages, even though we know that we have 17. Right. Um, <clears throat> so that's one piece of, of, of information. The other piece of information is that when we talk about strategies and techniques for students, we're talking about the best strategies for all students, including our ESL. And I understand that. So, so when you say that, is anybody being left out? Oh, no, 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 no. Everybody is included in that because what we're doing is that we're going to the research. We're looking at what the best strategies are for all kids with the, the undergirding statement of what is in the interest of our ESL students as well. And, and yes, sir, I, 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 I know that. But we have some of our teachers that are saying other things. Mm -hmm. And so that that's why, I, and, and you can't control that, I understand that. But, I, but uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a question I get. We can work on that, though, and that's something that we as a team have definitely been focusing on. And, and uh, it, really, that's the reason I wanted this to be a, a topic tonight. And I, right. asked Dr. And I appreciate it very much. Because we need to understand that um, a large percentage of our students fit into this category. We need to understand that it's getting harder to get funding in some of these areas, and that funding is crucial. And so uh, we're just trying to provide information for you tonight, and, and I appreciate uh, what you're commenting on because uh, Tammy has communicated with me too. And, and uh, it's partly because of the political picture. It can't be ignored. It's partly because of the population of uh, students that we have, but it also is uh, part of the philosophy that we have, that, that we uh, love them, we take them, and we teach them. And, and uh, we, what a great night this board meeting has been because we look at the challenges that you're talking about here, but then review that we had the Tournament of Champions presentation by uh, two of the most outstanding students that any school district in the state of Kansas could ask for mm -hmm. as far as performance and quality of education. So uh, I mean, we have a spectrum here, and we should be very proud, and, and uh, we're continuing to work in these areas. Right. Yeah. You know, I, the growth that I have seen in this district in my tenure here has been incredible. And I think that as we're moving forward, I think that we are providing services to all kids. And it is an inclusive system, yes it is. But I don't think that any child is being left behind. Now, am I saying that it's easy? Uh -uh. No, it's hard, it's hard work. Uh, and sometimes the hard work that teachers put into the profession is lost. Uh, because we're, I, I mean, it's just lost because of the political nature. It is very hard work, and I will not take that away from teachers. It does take a lot of work. Okay. Good to hear from you, Dr. Payne. Thank you for I the appreciate very much. Yeah, doc, just one final comment for myself, switching subjects a little bit. As it relates to the, to the recruitment plan, it seemed like based on your comments that recruitment awareness is obviously extremely important at this at this point so and I was looking at the uh, the action steps I, you know you don't have to answer this tonight either but is there anything that we as a board can be doing as it relates to supporting more of the awareness and recruitment aspect of the I've thought about that and I might come knocking <laughs> <laughs> please do okay all right Great. thank you dr. Vinton thank, yeah. thank you thank you all all right we've got public information next Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Dirksen. January is School Board Appreciation Month, and we do wish to thank you for the work that you do and the lives that you touch. And speaking of bright young lives, we had a great, great example this last week that I would love to share with you. Savannah Wilson uh, was a Ross Rhino alum, and she is now a Fort Hayes State freshman, but she has published a book titled a life full of color. She collaborated that with one of our Ross fourth graders, <laughs> and she was an illustrator for the book. Oh. Um, it is an amazing story uh, to help youth express their feelings through colors. 
It's a story of struggle, perseverance, and courage, and it is now available through Amazon. So we were so proud of them. They presented it this last week. Here's a copy awesome. of the book. It's fantastic. So I just wanted to, to spotlight that tonight. What's the title of it again? A Life Full of Color. That's awesome. So that was just a shining moment. So kudos. And thank you for all of your hard work. I'll quickly move into the one item I have on the list tonight, and that is to review the um, academic calendar that we are presenting. This is for information only. It's a first reading. According to the negotiated agreement, the calendar committee is responsible for determining the start of the year, end of the school year, the number of holidays observed, and 180 certified employee days. Members serving on the committee submitted one to three calendars for committee review and discussion. Fifteen calendar options were submitted for discussion this year, and the calendar committee narrowed the choice to three. The top picks were posted for the all-staff vote, which was um, administered through SurveyMonkey from December 4th, 2019 through January 6, 2020. The academic calendar, believe, received the most votes with 53%, LEAD received 19%, and achieved 28. We had a total of 333 votes for the calendar. As you'll see in your packet, um, the start date is on August 16th. Holidays are pretty much standard, with the exception of November 1st, which follows uh, Halloween. We had several teachers on the committee, and they felt like that was a wise choice. And the last day, then, is May 27th, with a total contract days of 180 contract days, rather, and 25 vacation days. So we are just requesting that you review the proposed academic calendar for 2021-2022 with final approval requested at the Board of Education meeting scheduled on January 27th. And one thing just to make note of, I'm sure it will be corrected by our next meeting, but yes. under staff recommendation, we do have the wrong year. Um, it is correct under recommended action, but we'll yes. get that. Thank fixed. you. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you. All right. Business services. Good evening. I have four different action items for you guys tonight. Uh, first, on page 67, uh, references um, a board meeting on August 12th uh, when you guys uh, agreed to or approved to have Building Solutions uh, be the construction uh, manager at risk for the Memorial Stadium project. And so what, the, what this is is the actual contract. Um, so we're requesting your approval of that. Uh, I can read you the next 66 pages verbatim if you like, <laughs> or I can just tell you that this is pretty much the exact same contract that you guys approved when you hired Hutton to do the admin building. Well, if we didn't have the national championship game, we probably uh, would have you go ahead and do that. Okay. Well, I tell you, if you read that, your honeymoon, just here to help. Your honeymoon would be over. That, that's what we have Clayton for. <laughs> that's what we have Clayton for. <laughs> In, I like the part where um, there are no costs for pre-construction. <laughs> Not at this time. I know. I understand. I make a motion for approval. Second. All right. We have a motion by Tammy and a second by Ryan. All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. And just like that, we get a fast forward 66 pages up to uh, page 132. And uh, uh, next, uh, we're asking for approval of the bid for the exterior signage. Um, you can see copies of what those will look like on page 134 and 135. Uh, we did uh, ask for bids, but we only received one back, and, and that was from Luminous Neon, and their bid request is $30,023.51. Um, do you have any questions about the signage itself? or? I, where's the demon going to go on that Dodge City Public Schools? Where does the demon go? Right behind it. Yeah. Not the high school, Pamela. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still our school district. Maybe you can talk to the city about the water tower. <laughs> yeah, Pamela, you weren't here during those years. We don't want to go there. <laughs> I have to tell you, 
the sign and the front of that building is awesome. Yep. Mm -hmm. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. We have a motion by Tracy and a second by Jamie. All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next on the list is a lease agreement uh, between uh, USD 443 and USD 613 leasing office space in the new admin building. Um, you can see that uh, it's a 10-year it's a lease. Uh, it includes, we provide them with the furniture initially now as the furniture deteriorates or needs to be replaced over time, then 613 will be responsible for replacing that. Uh, you know, it, it says in there that they cover 7.9% of the janitorial costs and those kind of things. That's based on the allocation of the square feet. Uh, so, so it's payable before they move in uh, and it's good for 10 years. And again, the, the, what they would pay us is 327,980.85. You have any questions on the lease itself? This is the last contract, right? Uh, yes. That's what I'm bringing to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is that your motion, Jeff? I'll move. Motion by Ryan. Second. Second by Tracy. All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. Okay, that brings us to page 149. Uh, and this is related to that, so since we uh, just agreed that we were going to provide the office furniture for them. This is the approval to purchase that office furniture at $90,480.85. I make a motion for approval. Second. Second it. Okay, we have a motion by Tammy and a second by Pamela. All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Dr. Dirksen. Okay. Um, I bring to you the uh, opportunity to extend my contract for renewal. <laughs> <laughs> it's greatly appreciated. Remember the chips and salsa. And uh, ironically, Grandma Alice is calling as I'm here. So <laughs> <laughs> did, did they renew you? <laughs> she still takes care of me, folks. I just want you to know that. But um, I would appreciate the extension of... Interestingly enough, the uh, original contract that I signed, if I don't bring this up, it, it, it renews uh, automatically um, unless you take action otherwise. So <laughs> I just think it's very uh, meaningful to be transparent, and I present it to you and would greatly appreciate an extension. This is actually adding uh, 2122. And as a side note, three years ago today, where were you? I was right here, very nervous, <laughs> finishing the interview on the Friday the 13th, uh -huh. and uh, we funny. closed it about this time because the weather forecast was for an ice storm to move in. Did that happen? Yes, it no, did. Oh, the ice apocalypse. Yeah. 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 I, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> I left yeah, town to get away from that. that. So uh, but anyway, that was exactly three years ago, January 13th. And uh, Well, I will have the honor of making the motion to... Um, Extend, renew uh, Dr. Dirksen's contract. Second. Motion by Jeff, second by Ryan. All in favor? Aye. Seven zero. And I thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. We appreciate you. Okay, quick question. Mr. Sheck, what time is this? Nine a.m. to Okay, thank you. It should be on there. It is on it's there. On. Oh, it is on there. I think it's on there. Reading is fundamental. <laughs> okay. Uh, Board of Education member district responsibilities, Park and Rec Advisory Board. Tracy, do you have anything or Jamie? Um, I do because I emailed Sean Steiner and he gave me the answers. Um, Good job, Sean. So the Rec Commission, a lot of the main conversations from the last meeting was uh, the demo of Lincoln School. One of the things they did move was the metal building that was on that property. They're taking it out to the athletic field it, it, at the Sheridan for a maintenance shop and storage. Um, they had, it looked like from the notes, discussion on the YMCA and the city and what their connection is and how they're funded back and forth and what that relationship is like. The uh, next meeting is actually tomorrow. So don't have anything for the okay. meeting. Very good. Thank you. 
Uh, Bright Beginnings Head Start, Ryan. Um, yeah, at our last board meeting, I gave this real long, eloquent report. I won't do that tonight. Um, <laughs> we meet. Uh, we meet uh, next week. We have a meeting on the twenty first, I believe, somewhere right in there next week. Um, uh, we did meet in uh, December. Got updates on uh, education, uh, grants, enrollment, everything. Everything we approved grants this evening. Everything's everything's going going well. So um, I'll probably have more as we meet after next week. But okay. that's what I have for tonight. Very good. Thank you. Uh, special Ed, Jeff. Um, Doug Meckel was out uh, at the end of December gathering information. We put together um, job description ads, and uh, I, I'm not quite sure the date where it's going to go nationwide, but uh, that process will be in full swing. Um, and then Doug will continue to interview uh, staff. Um, uh, talking about the position and you know what what we're looking for, so that process is in place. Um, we'll also meet um, with the staff to talk about the move and uh, to get that in order, and then we have to approve that contract. So a um, lot going on, and uh, uh, I'm excited about it. And uh, we'll take one step at a time. There you go. Very good. Do we have anything on legislate? Lady Ben. Well, the legislative session does begin this week, and uh, uh, Hammer and I did meet with Brad Ralph and with Bud Estes on two different occasions, and we were able to uh, share uh, kind of the school district point of view, and we're very appreciative of the school finance funding being supported by the governor and the legislature, and all we ask is that that continues. We did point out the high density issue and the sunset clause and the importance of continuing that and they were both very receptive to that, in my opinion, and so I feel good about that. And I do have a distinct honor of uh, having an invitation to be a part of the State of the State Address, which is Wednesday night, so I'll represent the district there and look forward to that event. So That's awesome. A lot of legislative news for you there. Great honor. Um, capital outlay, Tracy and Tammy, do we have any? Have you? Hammer, do we have any upcoming? No updates now. We'll, we, we'll meet again in February. Okay. Very good. Um, calendar committee, obviously, we're pretty set on that deal. Um, we've got review district bills prior to February board meeting. We've got Ryan, but he just did that. So I think... I think I was supposed to do it this month because Kathy called me. And I went, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I'll look at them. <laughs> but I looked, and Ryan's name was there. Then I saw that you were there next month. Yeah. So I'll do it next month. Okay, you'll do February. Okay. Um, announcements, January 23, 24, and 25 is the 77th Annual Tournament of Champions out at United Wireless Arena. January 27th, Board of Education Lunch Meeting at Central at noon. Um, February 8th is the Dodge City Annual Chamber Banquet. Um, at the conference center at 6 o'clock. If you plan to attend, please let Karen know no later than January 31st. The district will purchase employee tickets. If you'd like to bring a guest, the cost is $50. February 10th, Board of Education meeting here, Austin Boardroom, 6 o'clock. Do we have any items for future board meetings or information? Okay. We need an executive session. Uh, for discussion and negotiations. And, and that will include uh, Ramona, Dr. Springston, and Dr. Nance, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, our school attorney, the, and Hammer, um, the, the negotiation team. For how and um, I honestly uh, only want an introduction for you, and I think seven minutes is more than enough. Okay. Okay. okay I make a motion for executive session for seven minutes. Second. All right, we have a motion by Tammy and a second by Jamie. All in favor? 7-0. You all go and enjoy the game. Thank you.